peace now reigns. I'm walking with Jesus. I'm a child of the King. It's all because Living Faith for Today is brought to you by Share the Vision Ministries and hosted by Pastor Joshua A. McClure, who shares weekly messages of faith and hope on radio station WBLQ in Westerly, Rhode Island. Pastor McClure is a dynamic Bible teacher, counselor, and award-winning author of a learning library of nine spirit-inspired Christian books, including his just-released memoir, The Top of the Stairs. Along with this, Pastor McClure has written numerous Christian education resource materials including a two-year Bible-based curriculum for church schools, K-12, through adult, a men's Bible study, and PowerPoint workshops to grow and transform people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And now, here is your host, Pastor Joshua A. McClure. Welcome to Living Faith for Today. And we're delighted to hear you share in the living word of the living God. And today... I would like for us to consider the subject, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Now, in the beginning, God, these familiar words are some of the most challenging, thought-provoking, perplexing, unlimited, yet most hopeful ever written. They form the basis for the inquiry, who is God? Or what is God like? And even today in present day society, many people, including those who profess Christ, appear to have an unclear vision of the divine majesty of God. Many behave with shallowness and irreverence, lacking respect for the one who created mankind in his image and likeness. So whatever heightened image God may once have attained, he has now become little more than one among equals, one who is there when you need him. Otherwise, there is no need to think of him at all. It goes without saying that the God we claim and acknowledge today appears to hold scared resemblance to the God of the Bible, which means the question of God is still one of mankind's most debated and challenging questions. I am reminded of the story of a little girl who was in deep concentration over her drawing, and her mother asked her what she was drawing, and then she received the curt reply, God. Well, her mother protested, but no one knows what God looks like. And the little girl replied, they will now. With the very breath of God, entering the life of shell, came the divine query, Who do you say I am? Over the years, people have made attempts to answer the question of God in different ways, some assertively, some haltingly, some non-committal, while others have attempted to ignore it completely. But what is to be noted and not how one chooses to respond to God, but that one has an obligation to respond to one's Creator, like it or not. So the question of God is inescapable and never ceases to challenge. It never goes away, nor will it ever do so. Therefore, Jesus' examination of his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 exposes the fundamental problem of people today. 
When Jesus asked the question of his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples answered, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And Jesus then asked the more intimate, deeply penetrating question, who do you say I am? To which Peter, one of his disciples answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The first question by nature is relatively easy to answer. The second one much harder, for it is more personal, and the answer reveals more about us than we may want people to know. To paraphrase A. W. Tozer, what comes into our mind when we think about Christ is the most important thing about us. So our closer look reveals there are really two parts to Jesus' latter query. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? This is like a very intense and abrupt interrogation. With the you coming at the beginning of the sentence, Jesus is literally asking, but you, my disciples, my closest followers, with reference to me, who do you say that I am? Now, even today, much like those early recipients, many are waiting for God's intervention into human history. We have the scriptures. We have eyewitnesses of what Jesus has done. We have a history of his actions in humanity. We have seen how for centuries he has been healing folk, raising people from the dead, and feeding thousands. And still, we want him to prove himself. But what are those who have glimpsed the glory and majesty of God? What are those who have seen the King of Kings, his miraculous birth, his life and teaching, his miracles, and his triumph over death and the grave? What are those? who have learned Jesus' true identity as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. How have they reacted? Well, Scripture shows their response has nearly always been one of profound humility and repentance. When both Old and New Testament faith bearers experienced God, they saw themselves as utterly inadequate in comparison they stood in awe of the power and working of God, and not only they, but their enemies also stood in fear of Israel's God. And with that in mind, how do we explain the disparity between these early reactions and the modern dumbing down of God? How are we to understand the true nature of God and what we must do to recapture that sense of God's majesty, awe, and glory. Well, today, we're going to reach out to the Holy Spirit for some, for some answers. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 10, But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit. For his Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. And since this question of Jesus is born into the depths of God's being, we can expect the Spirit's help. Going forward, we're going to focus on what are perhaps these two most important questions we will ever be asked. Who do people say Jesus is, and who do you say that he is? In verse 13, we're told Jesus took his students to the village of Caesarea Philippi, about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Caesarea Philippi was pagan territory and the capital of the Roman province. It was a beautiful and picturesque spot, 1,100 feet above sea level, near the towering snow-capped Mount Hermon. But in the midst of his beauty, were multiple images of false gods. 
On one side of the mountain was a cave with a temple to the Emperor Caesar and to the pagan god Pan. In the niches of the rock were statues of various idols. The contemporary society in which we live today makes it fairly easy to picture Jesus in the midst of the setting, asking the first two questions in order to prepare the people for what was coming. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, we don't know who among the disciples answered the question, but from them, four answers bubbled to the surface. First, John the Baptist. Since John had been highly held in honor by the people, some thought that he had come back to life. Elijah, hundreds of years earlier, the prophet Elijah exposed what was in human hearts, performed miracles, and inspired people. And since Jesus was able to do these same things, maybe he was really Elijah. And then there was Jeremiah. This prophet was known to speak boldly and yet mourn over the hardness of people's hearts. People saw the same thing in Jesus, so they wondered if he was Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Some people could not decide, and so they thought he must be another prophet who had come back to life. Now, these are not bad answers in themselves, but they all fall short of who Jesus really is, because none openly confess that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And the point is, whenever you ask a group of people about Jesus, they come up with different answers. And it sounds and stands to reason they can't all be right. Some time ago, two men showed up at my door and wanted to talk about their faith. And when I asked them what they believed about Jesus, they said he was a very important prophet, but there were other prophets as well. And I told them, Jesus is the only Son of God, and that he paid the total price for our sins. And they started to respond by saying, but... And I interjected, there is no but. Jesus is a sinner's Savior who sacrificed himself on the cross as our substitute. He did it all. And then they replied, what Jesus did was good, but there is more that we have to do. And I smiled and said, Jesus is Savior and Lord. There's nothing we have to do but believe and receive him into our lives. And they politely excused themselves and headed back down the street. And it only proves our culture is just as confused about Christ as people were in the first century. Beloved, a right conception of God is a must. If we are to live out this Christian life, for well, how does one live as God wills in a world filled with so many trials and difficulties with a corrupted basic theology of the God who created all things? The primary belief is God created people in his image and likeness. Breathing into their emptiness, his life-giving spirit, thus recognizing his divine love and desire for fellowship. And any attempt to answer the divine inquiry, who do you say I am, must be accompanied by basic truths about God, which can only be revealed by his spirit. It's important to know what others say about Jesus, but it is even more important what we say about Jesus. Or you won't be held accountable for what others think of Jesus, but you will be eternally accountable for what you think and what you do about him. And surely, if there is any adequate explanation 
for people's actions today? One can only refer to the behavior of those who witnessed Jesus entering Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. In Matthew 21, where we are told, people spread their coats on the road ahead of Jesus. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds kept shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet, we read further in verse 10, the entire city of Jerusalem was stirred as he entered. Who is this? They asked. The gospel claim is of Christ's deep lodging in the soul to do the will of the Father. And yet, many still look for an earthly Messiah, which leads one to know the real question is no longer who is Jesus, but rather, who is Jesus to you? Is your answer like those who first said, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets? Or is it as Peter? He is more than a prophet, more than a good man more than a great teacher, more than a focus of religion. He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Therefore, if Christian history is to help us understand who Jesus really is, especially after the great exaltation that followed Calvary, we must lay aside our presumptions, conclusions, and humanistic intellectual theologies and determined to learn of him. And only then will we be able to answer his question knowing that before our response must come from the Holy Spirit to our spirit revealing the mind and heart of God. The writer of Hebrews chapter 13, 8 and 9 assures us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So do not be attracted by strange new ideas. And it means the time and place may change. Human leaders may change, but our God will never change. For ages, human institutions have tried to describe Jesus but to naught. History has failed. Art has failed. Literature has failed. Music has failed. Poetry, prose have failed. Philosophy falls far short. And psychology leaves much to be desired. All fall short of the need of the human soul, for none can change the heart. None can forgive sin. None can bring one from death to life. None can snatch a person from the brink of hell. No, none. But the one who queries, who do you say I am? And to be certain, there is an exam coming for all of us. And the good thing is that we have the question ahead of time. Who do you say I am? And I must warn you, to be almost right about Jesus is to be totally wrong. So we need to go to the only place we can be sure of the answer, the Word of God, the Bible itself. In the scriptures we are told that Jesus is Mary's baby, the Messiah, the Christ the Son of God, the Son of Man, the one the prophets foretold about, the one who reflects God's own glory and everything about him represents God exactly. The one Abraham was looking forward to meet, the one referred to saying Moses was not afraid of the king because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible, the one called living water, the Savior of the world, Come in the flesh. And the Father, 
not wishing to keep us in suspense, points out in John chapter 1 and verse 1 and following, he is the pre-existent word. He is the creator, for he created everything there is. Nothing exists that he didn't make. He is the light that shines through the darkness. He is the divine son of God. He is the virgin-born savior of the world. He is the sinner's spotless lamb of God. He is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. He is the one who took our punishment and died, the crucified one. He is the resurrected one. He is the ascended one. He is the Lord soon to return. Beloved, Jesus is all of this and more. But who is he to you? It requires an answer from personal knowledge. And before you attempt to answer the question, insert your name before it. John, Mary, Peter, Philip, who do you say? I am. Otherwise, you're like those in the crowd who had no answer, and yet, like those in the crowd, the question is inescapable. It is before you as it was before them. I urge you today to step out and receive Jesus as your Savior, and then you can answer. You are the Christ, the Son of of the living God, my Lord and my God. Be assured how you answer the question, for it will affect both your life and your afterlife. Beloved, be blessed today. Be blessed. Amen. We pray that you've been blessed by our radio ministry and will return again to hear words of faith and encouragement from the Word of God for Everyday Living. If you have questions or desire to contact Pastor McClure for help or comments, please send an email to sharethevision31 at gmail.com. You may order personally autographed books through the website at joshuaamcclure.net or contact your local bookstore. For information on book signings, please call 401-377-2591. For those wishing to support our radio ministry, you may send your gift to Share the Vision Ministries, P.O. Box 304, Bradford, Rhode Island, 02808. Tell of His favor, I'll tell of His love, I'll tell of His goodness to me. Purchase my redemption with his own precious blood, and from sin he set me free. So I am redeemed, I've been bought with the price. Jesus has changed my whole. This is Judy Hall Gray for Share the Vision Ministries, reminding you to please join us at the same time next week for Living Faith for Today. If anyone asks you just who I am, tell them, I am redeemed.